You're listening to The Audit, presented by IT Audit Labs. Welcome to The Audit, a podcast by IT Audit Labs. Today, we're going to talk automation and AI with Eric Pesek, who's joining Scott and Nick, myself, and Josh is on with us today, too. Josh is a music producer. We're going to hear a little bit about some AI in the music producing world. And um, Eric is a is an attorney and has going to show us a presentation that he worked on that was entirely done with AI. So, you know, the way it came to be is, as as we all knew, there was a whole lot of press, right, in January or so, you know, beginning of February, where ChatGPT4 came out. And people were super excited and you, people were talking about, oh, I, I asked ChatGPT to do this or that for me. And internally, so I'm a lawyer and I work within a, a larger legal team. And one of the questions that somebody asked, I say, well, will chat, will artificial intelligence replace lawyers? Because there's this, there was this fear that artificial intelligence was going to replace programmers, you know, graphic designers, uh, you know, all those different tasks. And those are the tasks that people usually attribute to, you know, this takes creativity. These are the things that no AI, no computer's ever gonna replace. And yet here we were in 2023 saying, you know, your job as a programmer, your job as a graphic designer, your job as an artist is gonna be replaced. So within my team, somebody just randomly said, do you think the AI will replace lawyers? And so I thought, hey, I'll do a presentation. I'll do some research on chat GPT. I'll put together a presentation on my, like I would normally do, you know, normal PowerPoint presentation. And on our, we sometimes do like a Friday brown bag or, or I mean, we haven't done it a lot, but we'll do these, you know, interdepartmental presentations and people will come. I thought that's a great topic for all the lawyers to say, hey, is your job going to be made redundant? And people did, they, you know, everybody started signing up. But, and so I started drafting the presentation and the way you might do, I'd do some research on chat GPT. And I got, I don't know, about halfway done. And I thought, why am I doing this? I'll just ask ChatGPT, write a presentation for me on whether AI will create, will replace lawyers. And it, it did. And it was, I don't know, like maybe 70% aligned to what I was already writing. It, it didn't, it wasn't fully fleshed out. And there was a couple of weak spots. And so in those areas, I said, explain why X. So they, the ChatGPT, you know, responded with something that was sort of superficial, perhaps. And I just asked it to explain, and then it fleshed out various answers. And so I thought, hey, this is great. I'll use this as my presentation. And I started, like, like I would normally, I started putting together slides to go with the script that it had written. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Why don't I have a different AI do the graphics for me? So I went to Dream Studio, and I just took keywords from the presentation that was written by chat, put them into Dream Studio, and said, you know, dra draft, not draft, but, you know, draw me some art in this style. And I think I picked different styles, but using these keywords, and it came up with all these images. And at that point, I thought, okay, we're going to go all in. I had already used for some other, I forget, some other project that I had, I'd already subscribed to an AI text to voice generator. I thought, I'm not even going to present this in my own voice. I'm just going to have AI do the text, do the content. I'll have AI do the images. I'll have AI do the voice. And then I started putting it into PowerPoint. And that's when I remembered that even PowerPoint has a, I can design the slide for you feature. And I thought, okay, this is a, this is perfect demo. I'll put it all together. I did, I used all, all four of those steps. I used, you know, either AI or kind of a, I don't know what the uh, PowerPoint equivalent is, but the PowerPoint auto designer. And then I just recorded it. And instead of me giving the presentation, I, I gave the presentation to the team as a pre-recorded video the day before my presentation. And at the presentation, I just said, hey, go watch this video first, come to the meeting, and we'll discuss it. And it, you know, it was one of the better attended meetings that we've had. People loved it. I, I, I kind of explained to them more or less what I'm explaining to you about how it came to be. And of course, you know, we had a lot of lawyers on the call, as you might imagine. And, you know, the, the bottom line that both I have and the AI came up with is that we're probably not going to replace lawyers at any time soon, um, which made everybody feel a little bit better. Um, but it was, you know, by the time I was done, I thought, hey, 
there are a lot of applications, you know, even this kind of tongue in cheek type of applications where you could do this, you could seriously do this, throw in a little bit of human intervention to fine tune it where the AI is, you know, just not as strong. And it could be a really powerful tool to use for lawyers. So a lot of what lawyers do, like if you're just doing legal research, you imagine it's like any other research, you're just researching stuff on different topics. Typically there'll be like a case that sets a precedent and you'll say, okay, what, what are the cases that follow this? Is that precedent still stand? That's the kind of thing that AI could probably do really well. That's a, that's a really boring part of being a lawyer, but it's also part where it takes some creativity because you're looking at other scenarios where similar facts might arise or overlapping laws that you remember as a lawyer that might apply. But the actual research and kind of writing the results of your research is very tedious. Like any other, you know, kind of writing a big report can be very tedious. But that's where AI could help lawyers and of course anybody else who has to write or has to come up with some creative solution. I thought this would be a great, almost a muse for you, right? It can do your first draft. As a, as a human, you'll have to finish that draft. But if anybody, if you've ever had writer's block and you're thinking, how, you know, I just can't get started. Well, here's a quick shortcut. Tell AI to do it for you, let them get started. And then you're in the mode of editing and correcting and fine tuning and rewriting, but at least you've got some content to help you get started. And that was, I think of, of all of our meeting, we kind of came up with that answer is that, one is it's not ready yet, it's close, but even in the, in the current state, it could probably be, do, do, uh, be used to do really good first drafts of things that lawyers do today. And so lawyers will probably be, the, the lawyers that are doing those first drafts right now, yeah, their jobs might be threatened, but they're the ones that they could co-opt that by use, they're the ones that should be using the AI today to help them do their first draft before they submit it to their, you know, their senior partner or whatever it is. And that's, that's kind of the story of how this came up. And then after I presented it to my team, I just said, hey, there's nothing confidential in here. I'll just upload it to YouTube and see if it gets any views. And like I said, I've got eight since February, not a lot, but, and probably two of those, at least two of those are my own, I would imagine. And you did voice, you, you, you had it speak in your own voice, didn't you? Well, it's not my voice. So I used, it's just a, I would say a generic AI voice generator. And you can pick different voices or different. And in fact, I could, let me just share my screen really quick. Sure. Why don't I tell you what, I'll start at the very beginning. So, you know, here's chat GPT. Here's Dream Studio that I use. In fact, this is my background right now, I think, if you, that I have in my background. Um, this is the voice generator that I use. And you can see, hey, I want, you can pick different voices. Hey, I want a young adult. I want a middle-aged man. You know, I want a, you know, another middle-aged man. You, you have all these choices and it will, in fact, generate something that kind of approximates, you know, different people. And, you know, it will try to, you know, approximate different accents. But what I did was, so I would go into chat, right? So I'd say, write me a presentation. And then you just pick about, I mean, you guys pick a topic. Scott, where did you used to uh, be a mountain ranger or, or climb or hike or whatever it was you were doing out west? Yeah. How about, uh, yeah, Yosemite National Park? I like that it knows it's a presentation, so it has to introduce itself. Mm -hmm. It's probably scraped every TripAdvisor posting that's to date, so it has a good training set. Yeah, and so I, this is more or less what I did. And let's just say, suppose it, um, suppose, so here it is, it's in terms of safety, it's important to know that wildlife, you know, be aware of wildlife and follow park regulations. Suppose in your presentation, and this is the other thing I did, I said, hey, that's too superficial. So I just said, hey, explain more about safety. Um, to get a little more detail, that's just for, you know, I don't know, maybe this is, maybe that was a super, uh, you know, enough, but maybe you wanted more. So it's giving us some things, wildlife safety, water safety, road safety. Yeah, all very good tips that I yeah. have said myself as a ranger out there. <laughs> Anything, Scott, that comes to mind that we could try asking it that maybe is more insider information? Yeah, let's ask it um, how we get a hiking permit for Half Dome. They require those nowadays, and they can be very competitive. 
nice, apply for a permit. <laughs> so this is interesting. One thing I remember about uh, at least chat GPT is that it, it doesn't search the internet immediately. It's really just going on older results. I know there's other chat bots that can just can also search and get updated information. I don't know how far back it goes, but uh, I assume this was at least updated at one at one point. I think ChatGPT was its data is indexed from like September 2021. So this this really is what I did. I, yeah. I just asked her to write a presentation where I wanted more information. I said explain, and then I you know I went to Dream Studio. Well. First, I tried to go writing a PowerPoint and start putting it in there. Um, and I've got a PowerPoint instance up somewhere, um, demo presentation. So what I would do is I would go to my the, the, the visit and I'd say, OK, well, here's my script, right? So maybe I'd have a slide for the first script. So I put it in the, you know, in my speaking notes, right? Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to talk to you about visiting Yosemite National Park. And then I thought, well, remember, I said I, I, I thought I'd have AI do my artwork. So maybe I would pick a key word from here and then I'd pop over to here and say, you know, my prompt is just Yosemite National Park. It seems like a good one. And then now there's a couple more options you can do, but let's just let it let it uh, mull over that one. Is this a free I, tool? So this is a paid tool. I've got 543 more credits and it costs $10 for a thousand credits, I think. So you can see here's how many credits it's using, 10 credits out of my 500. Um, let's scroll the top. So here it's grab, it's made some art for me. So maybe you just might download, I might download one. And then, uh, you know, this is gonna drop it in here as my background. And then, you know, cause this is a presentation on Yosemite National Park, we'll make, whoops, we'll, we'll send it back. Put that in front and I, you know, I did do a little bit of, uh, oh, that's right, I forgot. I'll leave it, let me just leave it as is. And then, home. Oh, here's what we did is we let the designer pick for me. So you can say, okay, well here, let, let PowerPoint decide how this is gonna be displayed, right? So here's a slide with the artwork direct generated by AI, the, the, the content that's gonna be presented. Um, maybe we can add this as the subtitle here, right? One of the most breathtaking iconic national parks in the United States. So I've already got my first slide, right? And then I just kind of repeated this almost like assembly line. So like today I'm doing it one by one, but once I realized what I was doing is I just sort of set up a little assembly line process where I took the whole text and I went through one by one generating images that let's just say this is gonna be our second slide, right? So I'd put this in the, in the text part of our second slide and I'd pick something, what would be the, the topic? Let's talk about why you should visit. It's just, that sounds good, why you should visit. Right. And then why? OK, let's we'll just drop this in here so for stunning view beauty. We'll, we'll just say, OK, we'll just turn these into bullet points because we're lazy. Right. And then we'll grab another picture. And then again, I could try to do something else or I could just pick one of these. And here's, you know, here's some generate. This one looks pretty good. It's kind of got the camera in there. A little the content there. You've got your script. You've got at least your first two slides. Right. So. Here it is, a couple slides all into it, and then you know you just repeat the process slide by slide. One thing that immediately comes to mind as a security person is um, how this can be used for like social engineering attacks. Um, so right now, something that's pretty common is you know sending an SMS say to a bunch of employees saying, "Hey, this is Eric Brown. I'm in a meeting. I can't talk, but I really need you to go buy me $500 in Best Buy gift cards and you know send like enter them in manually to this website or whatever." Um, it made me get a drone when you're over there at Best Buy. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm running out of drones. Um, but if if that could be like a like a voicemail delivered via email that's generated in somebody's voice based on you know some reasonable amount of training data, um, it takes it to a whole nother level, right? All of a sudden, it's your boss's voice in your ear telling you what to do, and uh, I would guess that would be way more successful. Or even a Teams call, right? We've got audio. I you know. Uh, I can't do the pass through audio, but if I figured that out, maybe I could impersonate Eric Brown right here live and say, hey, I'm, I'm reaching out on Teams because this is an emergency. You know, please go again, Best Buy or Walmart and pick up these cards. I, I was reading somewhere that Microsoft is working on an AI voice generator that it can train to sound like somebody's natural voice with just three seconds of sample. It's too scary. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So then you just need the deep fake voice, the deep fake, you know, face. Mm-hmm. And, you know, your, your CEO, your CIO is going to be sending you off to Walmart again. <laughs> the first, one of the other things that come, comes to my mind, not IT related, but people in, you know, college students are probably using this technology as well to write papers. At what point do we or what's your thought on potential plagiarism? Right. If it's generating this, is it giving a new paper every time or is it somewhat similar or canned? So, you know. Just like me sort of thinking, hey, we should use this to make your first draft. Right. Like if I was a college student or heck, if I was giving you know, any type of content creation, sure. whether you know, I'm a lawyer turning in a presentation, right? It wouldn't take much to edit it to make it your own. It's for the really lazy student who's just going to go out <laughs> like the same person who's just going to buy a research paper online is not going to bother editing it. Uh, you know, I think it's probably, uh, you know, pretty unethical. That being said, I did read where they're trying to figure out some way to watermark it. You know, the same way you might okay. watermark a video or a, 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 an image, right? So if I go and, and do this image, you know, they, they could watermark, oh, I'm not sharing anymore, but they could watermark one of those images. And I'd never tell. Now, how you watermark a text file, you know, what they were saying is that they might deliberately use words that are not commonly used, and that would be sort of red flags. But I think that's tough, though, because you think of like a college student is probably also trying to deliberately use words to make them sound more professional sure. or more scholastic or whatever it is. And I, I seem to remember reading an article about somebody who was, at least he claimed, was falsely identified as having used the AI to generate the article. And he said, hey, I'll show you my research. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I didn't hear the rest of the story. But they were talking about how they were battling with the professor to say, I've got my research. I can prove that I wrote this. That being said, obviously they got pinged by something. So how you know how are you going to detect this? You know, I have no clue because again, it's just a text file. Well, There's a kind uh, of. Oh, just jump in. Yeah, just I'm aware of Winston AI detection, which is being ah, okay. used by educators and publication public uh, publishers to uh, detect uh, AI written content up to Chat GPT four. So I think. They're kind of staying along with this, you know, to protect academia and the, the amount of money coming into that, those institutions. I think they're kind of on top of this, um, looks like from a quick search. I've kind of heard that on a few other YouTube videos as well. That said, I know you can, um, as as Eric was doing, you can take GPT's, GPT's output and say, hey, could you re- rewrite this in the style of Ernest Hemingway, you know? And it'll it'll do it. And I I wonder how much like how many iterations of that process it would take to really fool some of those, you know, likely AI based detection tools, right? Or even you know do what, you know, Google does for Google Maps, right? They'll throw in an error. So you as a as a as a student, you know, throw in some extra errors that a student would likely make, and then say you know. ChatGPT would not have made this mistake. I obviously made this mistake. I apologize, but at least I can prove that I did it, right? Yep. I wonder, though, you know, we're, we're kind of entering that era where the, the technology is, is taking a new path, and rather than fighting against the technology, um, should we be embracing it and looking at higher operators that we could work at as as humans because you know going through college you know back in my day to to use that colloquialism you'd go to the library you'd you'd research your stuff right before the internet you'd find what you were going to write on but really what what did that really teach me at the end of the day like what value did that bring me maybe maybe it brought value of like you know I, i could find something in the library or i could know how to take a collection of information and, and put it together in, in, in a paper. Will that have any value for future generations where you know, back in the day we used to take the rugs outside and beat them, but now we have vacuum cleaner, right? <laughs> um, is the the actual research of the paper going the way of the, the beating of the rugs? And, and could we operate at a higher level as humans where, yeah, the, 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 the technology is going to be able to search terabytes of data in nanoseconds and, and synthesize those thoughts much quicker than any human ever could. 
and then the, how the human applies that information is probably the real value of the human brain versus the actual grunt work of doing the research. An analogy there is something a friend told me about um, about how China's kind of tech sector operates, and that's that. So China is a tech leader, obviously, especially in manufacturing. But they didn't do a lot of; they don't have a long history of research and development in these highly technical areas. So they, you know, beg, borrow, buy, or steal um, a lot of this intellectual property, and then they just plunk it down in their factories and churn out the iPhones or whatever, right? Um, but if they, if that tap got cut off, and all of a sudden they didn't have that sort of history, that legacy of of research and development and intellectual property, would they even be able to continue functioning as a high tech economy? And there's, I think there's good arguments to be made for both sides, but um, I wonder if the same thing might happen in this case, where after a couple of generations of people who didn't do the research in the library, like Eric's saying, um, maybe we do sort of lose the faculties to even come up with, you know, uh, content that's I- interesting to human and humans, and it just all becomes kind of recycled, regurgitated AI, you know, garbage. <laughs> well, you know, I think I think it works both ways, right? So. We have we have some people in my house doing some remodeling, and they're using nail guns, right? They're not using hammers, right? We've not, I wouldn't say we've abandoned hammers, but for most framing jobs, you're going to be primarily using a nail gun, right? We use that, we embrace that technology. On the other hand, we're still teaching children to do their times tables in third grade, and my mind still relies on that, even though I have a calculator, I have a computer. But in ordinary conversations, you know, knowing a couple, you know, knowing a multiple of something will help you in your day to day life. Even if you, you know, the memor- memorization of it sounds, hey, this is just rote memorization. Why are we doing this? But the next time somebody asks you and you just need to sort of really quickly figure out whether something is in the same order of magnitude as something else, having that innate knowledge of memorizing your times tables or memorizing your powers or whatever it is still comes in handy. So there are things that we still want to keep doing. And yet we don't make the, the the framer guy use a hammer. We say, you know, go and embrace the technology, use that pneumatic nail gun. Um, so some things I think will, you know, will, AI will replace. And it would be rightfully so, like the first draft or, you know, you know, doing basic research or maybe even, I don't know, maybe there's some low level sort of cognitive creativity stuff that AI can come up with that we as humans can then go take and build upon. You know, I was, I was just reading an article earlier this week about some CEOs complaining, oh, my employees are working from home. They use, you know, chat bots to create their answers. So I'm gonna increase the workload by 50 times or whatever he said, something like ridiculous about 56 times. And my first thought was, you know, why do you care what tools they use to get their job done, right? You shouldn't punish them that for doing that. But after a second thought, I thought, but use that nail gun example. If people are using hammers and then they start switch to nail guns, you're not going to say, hey, keep doing the same work at the same speed that you were doing when you had a hammer at your disposal when you're really using a nail gun. Of course, you're going to expect your framers to get stuff up faster. So for that CEO, now, he was probably way out of line to say, hey, you're going to do 50 times the work. But for the CEO, one is don't object to your employees using AI. Tell them, hey, I can, I can tell you're doing it so much more work. That's wonderful. I'm going to officially authorize you, you to use that AI to, to do that work. Now, will you get more work out of your employees? Sure. But, but don't punish them by saying, oh, you know, 50 times the work for you. You know, hit them with the, the rug beater that Eric was talking about, right? So on one hand, you don't want it to be punitive, but, you know, it will take over and it will make our jobs faster. And accordingly, you know, the threshold requirements will probably creep up to match. And the nail gun does not know where the nail needs to go. True. <laughs> There's still a human and, in the center of the of the work. Yeah, that's the framer downstairs with like 30 years of experience of knowing, you know, how the how the the building should be framed up and where to put that nail, and you know, using that nail gun as a tool to you know implement it. There's paperwork that we come across in our daily lives and jobs that um, it is not hard to fill out but sometimes tedious, right? Um, when, when you think of the, the proofreading that you have to do or the, the, the multiple iterations that you have to go to to, to generate this, this content for 
very little return, right? If you're writing something that somebody's going to look at once or maybe never and toss in a drawer, spending intellectual capital on that is not a great use of time. So, you know, Eric, I, I like your idea and I, I've taken it and done it in reverse where I, I, I come up with the initial concept, you know, myself of like, you know, here are a couple of thoughts that I want to put together and then use chat GPT to clean it up and write it in a business professional tone or kind of whatever tone, you know, would, would suit the audience that, that it's being delivered to. And, and I've found that just in responding to RFPs as, as an example. So, uh, an RFP, a re request for a proposal, which is just an arduous mountain of paperwork that um, it's kind of a rite of passage where you've got to fill out all these long documents in order to work with an organization that already wants you to work with them because they've invited you to participate in the RFP. You could spend dozens of hours responding to these RFPs, or you could spend a little bit less time, frame up the idea that you want to deliver let ChatGPT generate the paragraphs of, of content and copy paste it in, which I found to be a, a, a pretty valuable resource because you, you don't even know if you're going to get the contract and, and why am I putting, you know, 30 hours into this thing if I may not even get the work. Computers have always been good at doing certain types of things like repetitive, thankless jobs like filling out an RFP. And I, I remember reading one quote where somebody's talking about, you know, when they when they said, hey, AI can now generate art and replace all these graphic designers. And the quote was, yeah, I don't need AI to replace all these graphic designers. Sure, it's great. But what I need is AI to fill out an application for a passport or, you know, incorporate my job, my resume into your job board without me having to retype it again. Right. You know, again, let AI do all the tedious filling out paperwork forms, you know, for mm -hmm. us so that we can get back to doing the real creative work that we want to do. And, you know, you look at your systems, you probably have them internally at all your systems. There's a lot of bureaucracy that we human beings have to wade through that maybe AI would be really good at bypassing once they get to know the re basic requirements that, that, that is required by your bureaucracy and also get to know you to the extent that AI can so that it knows, hey, this is all I need to meet this requirement. I can do that for you. I'm an AI. I'm thinking uh, income tax prep. That is my first application. Oh, my AI. goodness, yes. <laughs> That's probably the best idea yet. Yeah, I mean, you pay a couple hundred bucks for somebody to do that, and it's mostly, it's just a ministerial task. You know, pick numbers from here. That should be something AI should be great at. Right, you, could, you, know, you could upload all the documents, and then it could pull it all together. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll get resistance, so That's a good example. I mean, the, the tax return business is a perfect example because they resist the IRS has, has offered, hey, we will make the, the easy form available online for free. Just go online, fill it out, and go, and, and, and we'll do that. It's, it's the tax preparers who have prevented that from happening because they're protecting their jobs. Same way, you know, every time a new technology is going to put somebody out of business, there will be people that are going to fight it. Not because it's bad, just because they're trying to protect their industry. Well, they're going to need a great the... disclaimer for questionable write-offs so you don't end up on a AI-generated uh, <laughs> write-off list. <laughs> An AI audit. Automatically, yeah. <laughs> or, it could, or it could tell me why investing in all those meme stocks that ultimately led to losses <laughs> is a bad idea. I was going to say they used to have that um, that burger-flipping robot. And oh, yeah. I, I think it was the, the KUKA robot, and there's a pretty cool video of this um this kuka robot that they use in manufacturing and it's playing um i think the person's name is timo and he's a professional or olympic uh table tennis player and the the kuka robot plays against him mm -hmm. and does really well like so you know it's this robot holding a, a paddle playing against him and and that same kuka robot I think it was used or there, there was some trial use in fast food restaurants to do like dip the fries in the oil, flip the burgers, assemble the burgers, whatever it was. But um, it, it could just be that the the cost of entry for that, it's probably a half a million dollar device that requires maintenance and whatnot. The, the barrier to entry is cost where 
it just it's easier to have a human do those things. Um, the the ROI on it would be too great, even though that's probably a perfect application for AI, where you have somebody you know working in this task where they're doing repetitive things and. You know, maybe it's not the safest where you're working around hot oil or something, or you know, maybe take a, a foundry application where you're you're working with you know hot hot molten liquids. That the robot would be much better for than a human. Uh, you wouldn't have to condition the environment for the human, so to speak. But you you could probably operate these environments differently if they were designed with automation from the ground up, where you you wouldn't need lights or other you know air conditioning to some extent or heat to some extent um, where, where a lot of these things that are there for the comfort of the human or just to accommodate the way that they have they have to stand there they have their arms right and so you get that that robot that comes in and so it uses those same physical characteristics of a human but if you designed it outright where you know the burger just maybe goes to the thing and there's a, a you know i don't know how I, i'm just making this stuff up but like flips it this way you reduce the cost of having all that articulation because you're just trying to imitate the human instead of, you know, automating the process instead of automating the person. At the Alaska Airlines lounge, I think it's in Seattle, if I'm recalling correctly, but they have um, a pancake maker that the, um, you know, you say you want a pancake or whatever in it, the batter's in this pouch and the pouch kind of you know, the, the batter goes out on this conveyor belt type of system and 30 seconds later, the pancake just rolls off the end. And it's really the coolest thing. One of my first business trips overseas, I went to Tokyo and the Tokyo Narita airport, they have a beer pouring robot. And I don't know if you've ever seen it where it tilts the glass to the side, right? Pours it down the kids, it puts a little foam, perfect foam. And I remember thinking, I don't really need a beer, but I need to use this. I need to use this beer pouring robot, right? Yeah, and those are that's maybe a good two examples there of the line between where there's human value add and where there's not. With pancakes, I don't really care how it came about. I'm just going to eat it. It's going to be good. It's refined carbs, uh, the best kind. But with a like a bartender, maybe there is still that human value add. You know, the the human to human contact, the how do you like your drink made in a way that turns into a conversation that AI maybe isn't quite yet ready to to pretend to be. Yeah, it's novelty, right? Like, I wanted to get the beer because that was really cool. But, like, are you going to hang out in a bar that just pours beers that way? I mean, maybe you would, but, like, it's not going to have the same feel as, like, you know, a, a bartender that has, you know, the feeling for, do it, for doing that. I think, you know, good, good idea. Like, we think of AI, like, okay, as AI progresses, people compare it to, like, the IQ of a, of a dog, the IQ of a child, the IQ of, I don't know, a teenager, right? So you're thinking of, okay, this is, we're trying to improve the IQ of AI when maybe the real threshold is the EQ, right? When you get that emotional, you can, you can you know, maybe it's not fake, but where you can somehow digitize that emotional experience where somebody recognizes you, they are, the AI is like genuinely glad to see you again. The AI maybe is insulted or feels a little bit miffed when you cut them off short. You know, that's when, that's when you're going to get that real, you know, that real passing, truly finally passing the Turing test. You know, which reminded me, like, when, when they were complaining about AI making mistakes, right? What do they call it? Hallucinations, right? Like, I was thinking, that's the most human thing that it does, right? It makes a mistake, and then it, you know, can, it, it, like, it still gives you the answer, and it acts confident in its mistake. And yes, at some point, you know, you say, well, a true leader or a true professional owns up to their mistakes and, you know, and you learn from them. But a lot of humans don't. And it's a very human thing to do is to make a mistake and then be confident in your mistake and double, you know, really double down on that. So it's, you know, very genuine, you know, sometimes tragic. You look at the My Pillow guy, like he must know that he's made a mistake about the election. And here, you know, and, you know after he's been having to pay, what, $5 million for like being disproved. And yet, He's done this very human thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna double down on my mistake. Well, and this whole, the whole AI thing is also what China has been doing for a bit now. Maybe I'm mistaken, but aren't they using it as a social grading, right? So if you want to buy a house, you want to get a new credit card, you're trying to buy a car. They have all these cameras all over the place that are grading how your behavior is, what you're posting on social media, how you talk to somebody on the phone, right? So it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, or it is the same. Yeah, thing. that's you know that's a whole topic. 
talk for hours on that, but yeah, right. yeah, they and it's they're doing it today. You know, grading people on their behavior within society, or how good of a citizen you are, according to the you know the People's Republic of China, instead of how you're you've spent money in the past, or how, right, how likely are you to pay it back? It's you know, did you jaywalk yesterday? <laughs> how many party meetings have you been to? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I just how dropped a link in the you? chat. Uh, it's a New York Times article about actually Minnesota and nursing homes here and how robots and AI embedded in them are starting to be used for care of the elderly. So there's that EQ, that emotional um, piece, you know, there we can't pay enough people to go hang out with the elderly um, and provide them company. So here's a here's a place that AI can come in and fill, you know, literally empty chairs. And Josh, as a music producer, you're seeing AI come up in the the creation space too, aren't you? Oh yeah, we just had a very lengthy Slack conversation about that with my agency, my composing agency. It got very emotional, and a lot of opinions coming out coming out about it. There are already AI generated um, scores, music composition tools. Um, for example, one thing that I, I've been using for years, I don't know if this, this is on the cusp of, cusp of AI, I don't know if this is technically AI, um, is a drum avatar where, you know, you can put in the style of drumming that you want, because drumming is so hard, uh, such a tedious task in the studio, in the audio world. It requires a lot of space for the drum set, it requires a lot of talent, um, and a lot of microphones, yada, yada. So this avatar, you can put in a style, a tempo, and it will automatically generate a drum section for you. But that's even gotten, you know, crazier over the last few years where it humanizes it. You know, a lot of the electronic drums are on what's called a quantized grid where everything's locked into a, a tempo grid. Well, this will humanize it and kind of create little micro millisecond mistakes where you can rush the beat or slow the beat down. That's That's been going on for a, a very long time. Um, but now we're getting into full on scores. I, I did see Google's working on something that, you know, you can put in, I want a, a laid back reggae song with a male singer and um, it will spit out a piece of music. So the the temperature is kind of like, how much time do we have? Uh, is it getting is it getting red hot? Do we only have a few more years, or is this pretty terrible music to listen to still? And you know, one thing that I was thinking about, we we're talking about flipping the burgers, and is you know, there's the nuance. You know, things can be technically done correctly, but you know, when you're cooking, they say you put your foot in it. Well, in music, you put your soul in it, and I think there's always going to be that human element that, until AI gets so incredibly powerful that it can imbue that into what it's doing what's yet to be seen is if that's something that can be programmed or can be made into an algorithm that you know the humans will enjoy to the extent where it really moves them makes them cry you know makes them feel that kind of transcendental emotion that you get from a really great piece of art or music um I did see that there was, you know, just recently uh, an AI generated photograph had won a, won a contest. Um, I can't remember where that was, but, you know, so we're getting there with the visuals. You know, my my hot take was like we have maybe five years <laughs> as composers. But then like what you were saying, Eric, is, you know, maybe you're um, maybe you're kind of editing. Maybe you're being a curator of AI generated ideas and um you know incorporating that into some real instruments so it just cuts down the workload you know because if you're talking about doing a, an orchestra or you know a, a live band a seven piece jazz band um things can get pretty expensive pretty quickly so if you know these systems can kind of get to a place where the fun part of hearing the music and, and kind of editing the music is snapping fast um, maybe that'll cut down some of the costs and the workload. Of course, that gets into another conversation about where do the copyrights lie? If you have a Django Reinhardt sounding guitar part, does 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 Django, you know, a state get a, a slice of the pie? If the pancake maker at the at the airport is making my daughter a Mickey Mouse pancakes, does Disney get a royalty from the uh, pancake making machine? So uh, that's kind of where I'm looking at. You know, that's where my interest lies, and is. I think a lot of this will be settled kind of on the legal battlefield, so to speak. 
Um, so, Eric, I think you're on the front lines there. <laughs> For a while, just like you, maybe five, ten years, I think a lot of our jobs where, where previously felt pretty safe, music, you know, law, where AI is proving that they can cut, take a little piece of it. But again, maybe it's, maybe it's just going to make our, our jobs easier because it's going to take the tedious part out of it. And, you know, it's not going to replace live music, at least not anytime soon, until you have the physical manifestation of AI. Uh, you know, the pe- I'm sure there's other aspects of it. You know, the holograms. I just, got, I just got through a, we're doing a negotiation and there's like teams of lawyers and both sides have multiple business people on there and we're locked in rooms talking to people. And while I was thinking about this AI thing, about whether AI will t- replace lawyers, it's not going to replace that type of negotiation. Right? It's not going to replace people getting face to face and saying, you know, I want I want you to do more of this and I'm not going to be able to do that. And we can't comply with this, this rule. And my lawyer is going to explain it to you. And while the AI might be able to look up whether you're right or wrong as you know to what the law says you're supposed to do, it's not going to change the negotiation between people. So there's always going to be a rule or a role, I should say, for you know lawyers in that situation, just like probably for music generation. As clever as AI is, you know, would AI, you know, turn back the clock a couple decades? Would AI have come up for, to say, say, taken rock and roll, you know, disco, and would have come up with rap? Would it have come up with, you know, the same type of, you know, completely new music that came out of, you know, just people playing around with, you know, jamming at some point and, you know, throwing in something and, you know, like a new song. Every now and then you'll hear a new song, you'll think, wow. That's just amazing. Now, will AI come up with something like that? The way I was just reading about a chess move, you know, they said AI was playing chess in a way that no human ever would. So AI will come up with something new music wise, but still the same way a bunch of guys jam into some song, you know, that they're writing on the fly, uh, they'll still come up with something new that AI would not have come up with. Absolutely. I, th- I think it will further you know, make those j- subgenres into fractals. So there'll oh, yeah. be even more mini j- genres and there'll be more subgenres within those genres. It'll be up to us to decide what we want to consume, right? But, um, you know, I think where kind of the the value will be placed more will be the gatekeepers and the tastemakers because um, you can take, I had a friend that took a, a Beatles song and, you know, the guitars were slightly out of tune and he tuned each guitar string so it was perfectly in tune and kind of you know, fixed the problems with this, with the Helter Skelter. And he said it ended up sounding like a Bon Jovi song. <laughs> and it, it just wasn't the same. So I think a lot of that nuance and, and then the taste and the aesthetic and how much does the, uh, how much does the AI culture integrate with the human culture and where's, where's kind of the borderline of that. So that's kind of where we're exploring right now. I think we're seeing the same thing with photography. One of my biggest hobbies outside of work is photography. I've been basically my whole life. And I think, Josh, what you're saying, it's the same thing. And that contest, I believe, was National Geographic because I did see it. it was a picture of a cheetah, if I'm not mistaken. So but then there's the other part you take it right. National Geographic or these companies are spending all this money to send somebody to a remote place in Africa to take a picture of that cheetah closing down on a, you know, whatever, their prey. So you've taken the danger out of it, the cost. But at one point, it's, it's kind of going back to the argument of, well, film was dying, then digital came around. And then there's people now that are going back to film because of the art of it. And so now AI is taking over digital. So now digital shooters are going to be kind of the, become the purists versus the AI, you're right. So both your points, it's what's the balance? There was a, a, a show, uh, I think it's on Netflix called AlphaGo or, or a movie about um, the AlphaGo, which is the, so the game of Go and then just like Deep Blue, that which um, was IBM's Watson computing system that beat um, Kasparov a couple decades ago. Well, with um, Alpha Go, it played uh, the best Go player in the in the world, Lee Sedol, who's like a ninth dawn player. And and I, I during the the match, it, it it showed how the AI 
made a move that humans just couldn't conceive of. And, and you think, well, you know, from a from a chess perspective, or at least this is how I, I, I thought of it was, you know, a, a, a computer is able to calculate chess moves much faster than a, a human can. Right. So you make one move that computer can calculate moves that it could make that have a high probability of of winning. And because the, the chess game is smaller than the go board, apparently the compute resources needed to calculate the same moves for the Go game are just not possible today. So their artificial intelligence ha has done something else to to come up with the the how the AlphaGo works. But anyway, it, it said that during the match, um, and, and you could see during the match, they showed the, the, the footage of the match where the human, Lee Sedol, he was sitting across from another human who was making the moves. But he wasn't able to really read that person's emotions because that person wasn't the one coming up with the, the moves. Um, and, it, and it was, you know, the computer that was doing it. And uh, you could see that it really took its toll on on Lee over the course of those those uh, four games or so. Um, but I, I think one of the commenters made made the, the comment at one point in time, this move that we saw could be like a 10th Don move, which is, you know, like, there, there are no 10th Don humans. There's only, you know, I think nine is the theoretical highest. So that that was really kind of cool to see this application come to life. And, you know, like like you were saying, Josh, with uh, or, or Eric, with with music where rap came about from other musics that we've had, potentially AI could invent something really cool that we've not seen yet. Or heard. Or heard. <laughs> yeah. And Nick, was it a did, yeah, did I, the AI just generate that photo of the cheetah, or was it did did it enhance it somehow? So I I was mistaken. I did look. There was National Geographic did create an article or a post that showed a couple pictures of a cheetah to see you could pick out which one was AI versus actual, you know, photography or digital. But there was a contest where the person that won, and I put the link in the chat where he won the contest with his generated picture. And it's really an old looking, you know, film 30 old yeah. 35 millimeter film look right from, I don't know when a long time ago with a couple um, elderly females in the picture here. Yeah. And it looks like it's old film that was developed in a dark room, right? You can see this imperfections and the AI built all that in, right? And when you look at it at first glance, maybe if you get right up onto it, you can maybe tell it's a little too perfect, you know, to be real, right? It's AI generated, but at first glance, it's it's shockingly good. Because cheetahs don't have fingers, right? right? That's what AI hasn't it's mastered yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, like even today, like Dream Dream Studio, the one I was using, you can you can tell it what level of detail you want. And and like when I was showing you earlier, there's a charge for the computing power that you use. So if you say, hey, I want you know, so much computing power devoted to making this photorealistic picture, it will do it. It'll take longer, it'll cost you more, um, but you can, have, you can have it do that. I doubt that the version that I'm using online for, like I said, a couple bucks here and there is gonna give me National Geographic level results. But if you can do it, if I can do it to a certain level here, I'm sure there's like a really pro version that you can do a fantastic job with. There's an AI image generator called Mid Journey that you interact with uh, over Discord, and I, I was looking into using it for image generation, and I, I saw someone had written an article about using AI, ChatGPT, to put together the instruction set for the image that you want to generate through Mid Journey, because there's lots of different flags that you can set, and it's almost like a you know a 120 character long Google search where you you know you turn on all of these flags to get exactly what you want in the search. But you could do the same thing with the image generation of tuning how you get it to look by setting those flags. And as, as a human, it might be hard to remember that, right? It's almost like generating code where you could then use the AI to generate those flags, which I thought was kind of neat. Yeah, it seems like it would be right in line with, I mean, like you said, 
analogous to generating code, which is what people started using chat GPT at first. Hey, can you give me a hello world program for, you know, Rust? I don't know. Um, let, let it generate your code for you. Right. Yeah, could you convert this Java into assembly? Which should be crazy oh, yeah. if it could do that. Turn this rock song into jazz, right? Right. Yeah. When I one of the applications I see happening probably within the next five years is taking a piece of film or a whole movie and uploading that into a score generator and then mm -hmm. having the AI spit out 30, 50 different scores that are perfectly timed to the edits of the of the video and the, and choosing the mood. And then, you know, maybe you want a John Williams type score with Prince on guitar with John Bonham on the drums, you know, um, I think. And then, you know, there's a there is some money to be made there, though, in a way, because then you can get the John Bonham pack, you know, or you <laughs> could pay, you know, some of these people that have these estates, I think, will end up uh, monetizing those styles and figuring out legally how, how they can capitalize on, on those those kinds of um signature sound those will be interesting lawsuits right like <laughs> okay john bonham or you know any musician you own this song but do you own songs that sound like it but aren't necessarily copy or do you own somebody who plays the drums like you right you so everybody can do the double bass nowadays you know does he get a royalty for every you know everybody who does that with you know i i'm sure there's there's some limit where you you just sound too much like John Bonham, but that's going to be, you know, some fun lawsuits. So, hey, you know, job security for lawyers, right? I think you're set. You know, even John Bonham got sued for ripping off Little Richard. The introduction to uh, rock and roll is the introduction to uh, Little Richard song. Um, so, you know, they all those Brit pop guys stole a lot from the uh, African-American blues artists. So it's just about how far back do you want to go and, you um, how this stuff all kind of ends up rolling out and how it kind of changes and amalgamates throughout the years. It's going to be quite interesting. Thank you for you have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah, thanks, yeah, guys. Yeah, have a good weekend. Bye, all. <laughs> See y'all. Thanks. Bye. Want security leadership without the headcount? As an extension of the team, IT Audit Labs will provide the experts to guide and counsel your company. We will start by creating a custom security program that caters to your industry while providing transparency and remediation to improve cyber posture while reducing risk. Contact IT Auto Labs to find out more. Premium.